Okay, today we are starting a new study series on the book of Malachi. This is, uh, if you're wondering where it is in the Bible, it's the last book of the Old Testament, so it's relatively easy to find there. It's not a book that people read a lot. It's not a book that's taught a lot. I think this is my first time preaching about it, and I've been doing this for one or two years. So uh, uh, it, it is an, an interesting book. It's one of the minor prophets. Now, there are 12 prophets at the end of the Old Testament that are called minor. They're not called minor because of their messages. They're called minor because of the length of their books. And in fact, to some degree, they're all put there because 12 of them will fit on a scroll. That's interesting to think of, how scrolls might have had a... You know how we have to have television shows that go in half hour or an hour? Of course, the commercials, and they're all fitted into that. So it makes you kind of wonder, was there to some degree a little bit of shaping of the Bible based on the length of a scroll? Interesting to think about. Well, several of these uh, prophets are important figures, like Hosea and Amos. They're minor prophets, but they're important prophets. Malachi, on the other hand, you know, is probably one of those that most people would consider minor in the sense that his book is short, and minor because he doesn't deal with the grand sweeping issues of an Isaiah or a Jeremiah or an Ezekiel. And he doesn't write in the beautiful poetic language. In fact, this book is written in prose rather than in poetry, right? Well, one third of the Old Testament is written in poetry. Most of the prophets speak in poetry, not this book. This is a book that deals with things that we would usually consider smaller issues. So he is concerned with uh, things like this. Uh, details of animal sacrifice, the payment of tithes, bored priests, unfaithful husbands, and complaining laity. <laughs> well, I can relate to that. Okay, he's concerned with things like that. Uh, he does have a passion for justice, for uh, the widow and the orphan and the laborer, but he deals with a lot of things just having to do with worship. And some of the issues that he deals with may not sound at first like they're going to have anything to do with deal, going to connect up with your life, but I'm guaranteeing you that they will. A lot of these issues about what animals should be sacrificed are going to have surprising relevance. So this book is also framed around questions. It's only 55 verses long, but there are 22 questions in it. And there are questions that are raised by God to us. And then Malachi feels confident in giving back our opinions. He articulates what we as people think and how we feel. So he asks questions from us and some of them are questions that many of us would feel are almost inappropriate to ask. Questions like this, why aren't we more successful if God loves us? Why aren't you doing more for us, God? How can you say that we're not doing our best? We're trying to live lives of faith. So words from God, words representing us uh, to the people. When was this book written? Well, I'm going to give you some background on this. In 587 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed and the people were taken into exile. About 536, the Persians uh, defeated the Babylonians and people began to return to Israel to rebuild and to restore the nation. And they struggled to do that. It wasn't an easy task for them. We believe, well, we don't know for sure, that Malachi is writing sometime around 480 to 450 BC. This is a time when the people are back, but things are not going as well as they had hoped. They've rebuilt the temple, but it's not what it was before. They're living as a nation, but they're really under Persian control. They don't have a king anymore. They have struggling economically. Things are not going as well as they hoped, and they're dealing with this. What does this say about our faith? If God is there and he's in charge, why aren't we doing better is one of their big questions. All right? That's one of the things they ask. So that's the background for this. Let's look and see what the scriptures have to tell us. So we're looking at Malachi chapter 1 beginning with verse 1. And we start with something called the superscription. Whew, that's a good word. I went to seminary, you know. So, <laughs> superscription is the first verse of many of the books of the Old Testament that was put there to tell you what the book's about. So rather than just jumping into the book, this is who wrote it and why. All right? That's what we get here. Probably not written by Malachi himself, but by somebody else as an editor, putting it, getting it ready for the Bible. And it starts off, a prophecy. So what's this going to be? It's going to be a word uh, from God, uh, a message to us. A prophecy is that word of God given to us to help us know how to live lives better. It sometimes deals with the future, but often deals with what we're dealing with today. A prophecy, the word of the Lord. Now, I will tell you that Lord in, in this should be all in capitals across there. Lord would be the word Yahweh. 
So this is the word of God, the living word that speaks to us, a word of hope and salvation and of challenge to Israel through Malachi. And you notice it's got a little note there, a little A by Malachi. That's because Malachi is probably not his name. And you're going, they named the book Malachi. Why would they do that if it's not his name? Because the word Malachi actually means messenger. So it's messenger of God giving this word. It could be a proper name, but it would be as weird a proper name as messenger would be today. So if you came in and said, I'm naming my kid messenger, we'd all go, huh. That's what the name would be like. We don't know of anybody else named messenger in the, uh, in, in, in the Hebrew writings. So it could be a title, it could be a proper name. So most people think it is, but we all refer to it as the book of Malachi. So for my purposes, Malachi, but it means messenger. And that's an interesting thought. My job is so, such that I don't even have to give you my name. My job is to be the messenger of God. That's what he's saying here. All right, let's look and see what he has to say. First, verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord. Now, that's put in a past tense, but in Hebrew, you have to kind of guess what the tenses are. This could just as easily be, I love you. That's a message we give all the time, isn't it? We even teach uh, little kids, the uh, first thing almost we teach them is, Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? I remember years ago when we were starting up our preschool here, we had, we had a parents' night, and we were talking to the parents about uh, what we were going to be teaching in our preschool. And I remember there was one person who was, hadn't been to our church, and he, he said, uh, you know, I've been reading online that you guys are semi-Arminian in your theology. He says, I want to know how that's going to affect the children in the preschool. <laughs> I started giggling, of course, because I said, you know, honestly, we're not going to get to semi-Arminian th theology with three-year-olds. We're, we're, <laughs> we're hoping we can teach them Jesus loves you, you know, and, and, and we try to give that message over and over and over again in various ways, right? And yes, we'll get to a few of the other teachings, but we're not going to get into deep theological things. We begin with the basics, right? Jesus loves you. And we sing that. We teach it. We believe that. So God is saying here this statement that we would find everywhere in the Bible. I love you. That's the opening statement. And they respond, but you ask, how have you loved us? Now, that's a question we don't hear a lot in church, is it? But it's a question probably a lot of people have. You tell me God loves me. But how do I experience that? How do I know God loves me? I'm going to be asking you that question later on and ask you to come up with some answers. So understand towards the end of the sermon that's going to be happening. But think about it. How do you know that God loves you? The Bible tells me that, but how do I know? And there are people who are struggling economically. They're under political domination from the Persians. They're struggling in many different ways. And they're going, huh. How do we know that God loves us? That's their question. And I'm going to tell you that Malachi is going to answer it, but he doesn't give the answer that I would give. Probably doesn't give the answer you would give. It is an answer that you do here, even today, and we'll talk about that. But he also phrases it in a way that's not very helpful to us. So of all the passages in Malachi, we're dealing with the hardest one today. So just understand that. It'll get smoother and easier as we go. But he says, how have you loved us? And this is the answer that's given. Verse uh, it goes on. He says, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Now, that doesn't sound like a good answer right off of the start. How do you know that, uh, how, how do you know that we've, I love you? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? <sighs> okay. First of all, did you know Esau was Jacob's brother? <laughs> Who are we talking about here? Remember Abraham? God established his covenant with him. He said, leave the land that you're at. Go to a land I will show you, and I will give you many descendants, and I will give you this land, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and this connection and covenant were made. And that promise was given from Abraham to his son Isaac, and then Isaac had two sons, twins, Jacob and Esau, who did not get along with each other, all right? And the promise of God went to Jacob. Jacob, by the way, means heel or creep. He is the father of Israel. And that's the new name that he is given by God. Israel means one who wrestles with God. So the promise goes down through them. What happened to Esau? Esau goes out and starts his own nation, his own people, and he becomes the father of Edom, this other country. So down through Israel's history, there have been these two little countries next to each other that are connected, sort of semi-related, but they're not fully related. And they've gotten along sometimes, and they haven't gotten along sometimes. All right? That's the background of this story. 
And God has been described in many different places as loving and caring for this people, having a heart for them. But by this time in history, they have ceased to exist, and we're going to hear about that now in the next few verses. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated, and I have turned his hill country into wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. And that's the verse that everybody hates and goes, what the heck? God hates somebody? Uh, that's something I haven't read. The Bible tells us that God loves everybody, right? Uh, so why does it say here that he hates Edom? Well, I'm going to walk you through this. First of all, it's an example of hyperbole in the language that people used in those days. Uh, not just of, uh, of Hebrew uh, language, but of all the area around there. They talked in this way about priorities. So for an example, in the New Testament, Jesus says this in Luke chapter 14. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, as well as his own life, he can't be my disciple. Well, most of us are going, I don't hate my father, mother, children, brothers, sisters, wife. Am I not a disciple? What does he mean by hate there? Obviously, he can't mean hate in that way, the way that we usually think of it. Instead, it's supposed to make you think of comparison. Comparatively speaking, where is your priority? Your priority needs to be God. So think of the Shema. I love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then it adds, and your neighbor as yourself, right? It tells us that we're supposed to love, but our priority is supposed to be God and others. And then ourselves, right? So he's really saying here, comparatively speaking, you have to love God and hate others. All right? Comparatively speaking. Does that all make sense? Okay, I'm hoping it does. So when he says here, I love Jacob and I hated Esau, we also need to know that over, uh, in the wholeness of Scripture, Esau is spoken of favorably. God loves it and cares for it and has nurtured the nation in many other places in the Bible. And we need the full witness of Scriptures to really understand. But finally, you need to understand this. Towards the end of their histories, both Israel and Edom struggled. We know that the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed in 722 and ceased to exist. The southern kingdom existed until 587 BC, and then they were destroyed by the Babylonians. When they were destroyed, Edom was living in a place where they, they thought they were safe and they were protected because their country is all this rocky, deserty terrain that's super hard to conquer. They're the Switzerland of the ancient world. Uh, very seldom were they ever conquered by anyone because their land was so remote and so desolate and so hostile and so easily easy to defend. So when Judah and Jerusalem were being destroyed, guess what the Edomites did? They didn't welcome in the refugees. They didn't go and help their brothers. Instead, what they did was they said, ah, this is an opportunity for us to take advantage of them. So they invaded themselves. And they took over many cities and then they actually went up to Jerusalem to help the Babylonians sack the city. And then when the refugees were fleeing from there, they captured them, stole all their goods, and turned them over as slaves to the Babylonians. People were not happy with their behavior. <laughs> all right? Think of this in a modern context. Think of uh, the Russians invading the Ukraine. I have a friend who's a, a, a family friend who's in Moldova helping them with the refugee crisis there. Moldova is this tiny little country and they're taking in all these tens and hundreds of thousands of refugees trying to deal with them all, right? <coughs> Can you imagine if they had reversed that and said, well, this is a great opportunity. Let's just steal from them all and put them into forced labor. That's what the Edomites did. There's a whole book of the Bible, the shortest book of the Bible, the book of Obadiah, talking about how bad their behavior was and how there would be punished for that, right? So, leaving that aside. So, what happened to them? Well, when the Persians came to power, they actually did invade Edom. And when they invaded, they conquered the land and made it desolate. And the Edomites apparently tried to rebuild. Now, Israel, Judah was destroyed. They did rebuild. They came back. They were restored their nation. They rebuilt the temple. They're back there in their land. The Edomites were not able to do that. In fact, they disappear from history at this point. Right? Do you see Petra? That's built by the people who replaced them, the Nabataeans who come in next. Right? Edomites gone from history. So that's the background of this. And he says, Edom may say that we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord says. 
They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land of people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see with your own eyes and say, Great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. So, God says, I love you. The people say, How do we know that we love you? And God gives this answer. You're still around. <laughs> That's not the answer I would have given. But I will tell you, it's an answer you do here today. How do we know that God loves the church? Well, after 2,000 years, despite its failures and its sins and its mistakes and its errors, the church is still there. So many people would say, why is it there? Well, because God is, loves the church. He won't let it fail. He keeps it going. Very similar answer, isn't it? Other movements may come and go. Uh, nations may rise and fall. But the church endures because it's connected to the eternal power of God. So that's kind of the same thing he's saying here. You may wonder if God loves you. It may not seem or feel like it at the moment, but the very fact that you're here shows that God loves you and cares for you and has a heart for you and your causes. That's kind of an interesting thought. How do you know that God loves you? In the same way that God knows that we love the church. And I will tell you, this is an issue for us uh, today. You know, uh, we're, we're in this process of disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church, and, and at least in part, I think one of the reasons we were doing that is because we see the United Methodist Church, especially in our area, in kind of a death spiral. You know, probably not going to survive. I don't know if we will. I look around at our church, we have a lot of older folks. Can we have enough energy and strength? Can we tie in in prayer to the power of the Holy Spirit to be changed and transformed as we go forward? I hope and pray and believe so, but it will be challenging for us, right? And then... I wonder about the church in general. Well, I think the church in general will survive because it's connected to the eternal power of God. Uh, it's the source of life. Uh, God is the source of life and hope and strength for us in the future. And the church will endure. What about us as individuals? You know, are we going to survive? Are we going to go forward? You know, are we connected to what is eternal? How do we know God loves us? especially when we're struggling and not finding the kind of success we think we should have, right? That's not a dumb question. Hebrews 11.6 says this, I'll quote, And without faith, it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe, so here's a definition of faith, must believe that he exists, that God exists, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So to have faith, you have to believe that God exists and that he rewards us. So what do you do when you feel like you're not successful? Do you feel like God's not rewarding you? Well, that's a question we see often in the scriptures. And it's probably a question that a lot of us have. Why aren't we more successful as individuals, as families, as a church? Why aren't we growing in the ways that we think we should be? Or in the, uh, finding the kind of success we think we should have? It's interesting to read this book and hear these questions right after we looked at Philippians. Do you remember in that book, uh, the situation? The people he was writing to in Philippi were poor. They were struggling economically. They were facing persecution. And Paul's writing them while he's in prison awaiting possible execution. And he talks about the joy of the gospel. He talks about the reward that he has spiritually. But here they are looking for an outward sign of this reward. Is that dumb? Well, I'll tell you, I work with guys in prison, coming out of prison, and when I work with them, one of the things we often tell them is, if you can leave, get rid of the drugs and the alcohol and the negative behaviors that have been making your life miserable, you'll find success in this life. You can be a blessing to your family. You can be uh, uh, maybe not a father and a husband again, but you can at least bless your family in some way, right? We often promise them that they can do better financially and materially than they did before. Isn't that true? Don't we often tell that to, to our kids? Work hard, <laughs> save up, you can, you, can, you can do it, right? So I, I'm sympathetic with that, but we also recognize that ultimately the rewards we're talking about are not material so much as they are spiritual. Tied into the material, though. It raises the question, how do we know that God loves us? You know, when I think about people in my life, how do I know that they love me? Well, I often look to what they have done for me and the blessings and sacrifices. You know, I've shared before that uh, uh, I, I can think back with my parents and know that they love me because they did things that were sacrificial. You know, uh, I, I remember one time for my birthday, uh, my dad bought, uh, uh, my mom and dad bought me a, a bicycle. 
which in a, I, I'm a family, our family had nine kids, so getting me a bicycle, that was a one-time shot. After that, I was responsible for buying my own bicycles, right? Uh, but they bought that. And I remember, uh, uh, it was the, my mom shared with this, you know, that, that we could always tell when things were a little hard at our house because we got certain <coughs> foods. Do you like this? <laughs> certain foods that were just significantly showing that we were having some financial struggles. We would get uh, Rice Krispies in the giant bag, whatever they were. And we would get, uh, my mom would make something she called squaw corn, which was corn with bacon and onions in it, which sounds like it would be expensive today, but at that time we ate it when it was cheap, and we would eat popcorn several times, and smelt, which I hate. I loathe smelt. <laughs> but we would get smelt sometimes when uh, we were hard up. Anyhow, we're serving this, and she says, uh, I says, well, how come we're eating so much smelt? You know, because I'm, I'm put the dots together. She says, well, we bought you a bicycle, right? So we're eating smelt. <laughs> you see the connection there? You, you go, that's what we do. So how do you know people love you? The sacrifices they make, right? How do you know that God loves you and cares for you? So I said I would ask you this question. How do you know that God loves you? Let's hear some of your answers. How do you know? Anybody? Yes. How do you know God loves you? Okay, so family is one way of knowing, okay? The blessings we get there from the people around us that we love and can care for. How else? Yes? Uh, God sent us the advocate. See, most of us jump right to that. We got Jesus who has uh, died for us and, and gave us this. Uh, he's, our, he's there with God pleading our case right now. What else? Shelter. Shelter. Yeah. We have homes to live in. You know, we're not living on the street. Anybody else? Yes? He doesn't always punish me even when I deserve it. There you go. That's a good one, isn't it? I don't always get the punishments I deserve. Amen. Anyone else? Yeah. So we got beautiful creation to enjoy all around us. Yeah. Another family member, that's a beautiful story too. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. We have spring every year. <laughs> There's always new chances, aren't there? Our garden will do better this year. <laughs> yeah. I'll give a few more. How do I know God loves me? Yeah, Rudy. How about one? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's when you don't hear a lot, but the benefits of aging, you do get to see everything, right? And experience things at different stages of life, see how things progress, get to see and help and bless others. So there's lots of things that we can find to, to know about how God loves us. I was just watching a movie the other day where they said you should have a golden list. Every day you should get up and write down 10 things that you're thankful to God for right? Which would be a kind of a good thing to do. Just the 10 things you're thankful for each day to start off. Maybe I'll challenge you all to do that. I'm going to finish with this story about Jesus loves you. You know the song we sing all the time, Jesus loves me, this I know for, the Bible tells me so, right? The scriptures bear witness to that. But we all think of that as a children's song. I, I, I don't know if you know that. It was not written for children. It was written by two ladies who did a Bible study with the West Point cadets, all right? And every month they wrote a hymn for them, which they tried to then sell because they were pretty poor, uh, and they would write this hymn for this class that they taught. And so they wrote this in 1860. So think of that. 1860, they wrote, Jesus loves me, this I know, 
which meant that the cadets who learned this actually took it with them because they loved this song. It wasn't sung to the same tune and it didn't have the chorus at that point, but they took it with them and both soldiers on the north and the south were singing that truth as they fought the war, which I don't know about you, but changes my whole perspective of looking at this song. You know, think of it about little children, but it's really about young men who were going off to battle, leading people in battle, and singing this song to confirm their faith and to let them to see God's love in the midst of horrors. Uh, it just changes my, the way I look at it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That change in perspective really makes all the difference. And I said that was going to be my last point, but I'm going to add this. When I work with guys in, uh, in prison, one of the hardest things for them to believe is that God loves them because they've done horrible things and they think that God hates them because they've been evil and punishes them. And one of the things we tell them is that God is your friend, right? And that is a life-changing perspective for many of them to realize that God does care for them. I know it says God hates Edom in this. We'll leave that aside. It's a hyperbole, okay? But here, to recognize that God loves them changes everything in their lives. Suddenly, grace and life and hope are available to them. And affirming that, even in difficult times, opens us up to that grace, power, and life of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the new opportunities that are available to us. That even when we are full of faults and failings, you are still there with us. You guide us through. You take us home. You are our blessing, our hope, our life. We pray, Lord, that you will never abandon us, for we know you won't. And we pray, Lord, that we will always know your strength in life. Help us to hear this word and to hold fast to it. In Jesus' name, amen.